America's West, the nation's frontier a century ago, challenges us once again. Today, the search is for uranium, the proven alternative to oil, gas, and coal as fuel for electrical energy. But the process of making electricity with nuclear fuel takes place behind protective walls of concrete and steel, and therefore can't be seen. What we can't see, we sometimes don't understand until we look from a different perspective. Millions of years ago, large masses of minerals were deposited in riverbed areas like this. One of those minerals, uranium, is now the object of widespread exploration because uranium is the source of nuclear fuel. The search is conducted from the air and on the ground. Uranium is hard to find. But the need to find it is important because except for coal, our fossil fuel supplies are being depleted and nuclear fuel is the only currently available substitute for producing significant amounts of electricity at reasonable competitive costs. So in the vast lands of the West, promising sites are examined carefully. Samples are minutely scrutinized for mineralogical clues. The helicopter carries an instrument that's sensitive to gamma radiation from the ground. It improves the chances of locating uranium in quantity. It is a coordinated effort. Only an on-the-spot check can confirm the significance of aerial observations. At field laboratories, samples undergo further investigation. Do they indicate a commercial deposit of uranium or only a trace? With maps of exploration areas, geological and geophysical information is developed. Uranium often occurs in formations similar to those in which oil and gas are located. Once some indication of a possible commercial deposit is found, claims are staked on public lands or the ground is leased. Commercial deposits of uranium are scarce. Only one area in a hundred, sometimes only one in thousands, will actually yield enough to make mining worthwhile. Large numbers of samples must be taken to determine the location and quality of the find. Drills are used to bring up material from below in an effort to confirm what the surface data suggested. The machinery resembles an oil exploration rig, but it's smaller. Radiation sensing tools produce a gamma ray log, which gives further evidence of the location and quantity of uranium at the site. In a commercial deposit, there are only small concentrations of actual uranium. From every 2,000 pounds of ore, perhaps two pounds of uranium are extracted. Here, production normally exceeds 2,000 tons of ore a day, equivalent to the energy in 130,000 barrels of oil. As the overburden or upper layers of earth are removed, Geiger counters and other instruments tell when uranium-bearing strata are reached. Readings have to be taken carefully and often because uranium deposits may occur in layers only a few inches thick. 
The radioactivity of naturally occurring uranium is quite low, so the ore is safe to handle with only routine precautions. After mining, the area is backfilled and reworked to blend into the terrain. Reseeding makes the land suitable again for grazing. Such extensive land restoration isn't needed for another method of uranium extraction called solution mining. By pumping a solution into the ground through injection wells, the uranium below is dissolved and brought to the surface. This new technique makes it possible to recover uranium economically from great depths. The uranium bearing ore that has been taken from the surface mine is trucked to the mill. On the way, a stop for testing. sample is taken to determine the actual percentage of uranium each truckload will yield. It is placed in an instrument that records a direct measure of its uranium content. In several steps, uranium in the ore will be extracted and concentrated just the first of a long series of processes that will eventually produce fuel for generating electricity. Thousands of tons of processed ore a day move by conveyors to a group of storage bins. Mills have the latest equipment for controlling dust, fumes, and noise. The ore is first crushed and ground by the tumbling action of steel rods in a rod mill. Later, chemicals will remove the uranium from its ore, a technique called leaching. Sand is removed from the uranium solution in settling tanks, another step to eliminate impurities. The final product will be uranium oxide. Its color in liquid state has given it the name yellow cake. Yet when it's ready for shipment, the yellow cake, now a powder, isn't yellow, but rather a dull greenish brown. The yellow cake, after being converted into uranium hexafluoride, a gas, is sent to one of three sprawling plants like this, owned by the U.S. government and operated for the Department of Energy. Here, enrichment takes place a so-called gaseous diffusion process that increases the amount of the key isotope U-235 in the uranium and thus makes it usable as fuel in commercial nuclear reactors. For every five pounds of natural uranium delivered to the enrichment plants, about one pound leaves as enriched fuel, and about four pounds of depleted uranium are stored in the shipping cylinders for potential use as fuel in advanced nuclear power plants, called breeders. After enrichment, the uranium is shipped to a fabrication plant where fuel for nuclear reactors is produced. The uranium hexafluoride gas is converted into uranium dioxide powder. Batches of it are blended for uniformity. Then the power
powder is pressed into small pellets of precise size. Each pellet can generate as much electricity as two to three barrels of oil or half a ton of coal. Quality control in these plants is the most demanding of any in industry. Each pellet has to be near perfect, both chemically and physically. Imperfections could cause fuel failures, which would result in costly downtime in electricity production. The technicians wear gloves, so perspiration will not contaminate the nuclear fuel. Pellets are sintered, that is, heat treated to increase their hardness and density. After grinding and washing, the pellets are dried to prevent undesirable reactions between pellets and the metal tubes into which they will be placed. A last electronic check ensures no pellet is nicked or otherwise faulty. Any pellet that does not meet every specification is rejected. The finished pellets are fitted into long tubes of zirconium alloy inside a controlled atmosphere chamber to keep out moisture and contaminants from the air and surrounding area. Under the most exacting conditions, the pellet-loaded tubes are welded to form a permanent seal. True bonding is achieved by working with tungsten electrodes in an inert gas atmosphere. It keeps out traces of oxygen or other foreign substances. Tubes are meticulously inspected before being loaded with fuel. The purpose is to check on wall thickness, diameter, and for any flaws that might contribute to rod failure. Tube integrity is assured by ultrasonic and x-ray tests. The rods are etched in a mild acid solution and then rinsed in clear water another step to assure durability in service. Random rod samples are cut apart for microscopic examination. X-rays of pellet holding tubes verify the loading and welding processes. A number of loaded sealed rods are clustered to form a fuel assembly. The rods are held in precise position with each other by a series of spacing devices. At both ends of the assemblies, a kind of grid called a tie plate locks the rods into place. The tie plate must be machined to the most minute tolerance. Inspection follows inspection. The pattern of the rod arrangement, its exact location within a few thousandths of an inch is essential because an atomic reactor's core requires a fixed geometry of fuel if the energy from atomic fission is to be produced efficiently and safely. To remove any specks of dust from the fuel assembly, it receives a final washing in an underground tank. Depending on reactor design, from 36 to 264 rods make up a single assembly. 
spacers and end fittings maintain precise rod-to-rod -rod position, alignment, and dimension. The core of a nuclear reactor typically holds from 120 to 848 of these assemblies. The assemblies are packed in custom-built steel shipping containers to ensure that the spatial arrangements of the rods are not disturbed during shipment. Instructions are bilingual when the fuel's destination requires it. The shipping containers carrying fuel assemblies are now ready for transport to nuclear power plants around the world. The facilities that generate electricity with this kind of fuel are the objects of safety questions being raised by many people. While nuclear reactors cannot explode, they do create high-level radiation which is dangerous to human health. The industry has established elaborate, successful procedures to protect both the public and workers. And no one in the U.S. has ever been injured by commercial reactor radiation. Nuclear reactors like this operate very much like conventional power plants. They boil water to make steam. The steam spins a generator. The generator produces electricity. Instead of burning coal or oil, nuclear reactors create heat by splitting atoms in the uranium pellets. They have been doing that in the United States for more than two decades. But concern increased after the breakdown at Three Mile Island and precautions were intensified. Regulatory procedures tightened, instrument concepts revised, design, construction, site selection, and environmental controls reviewed. Nuclear power utility companies are also placing added emphasis on the people who run reactors, particularly control room operators, to make certain that they're highly qualified for their assignments. At facilities like this, Instruction in theory is coupled with hands-on experience in a rigorous course. Here, students learn about fuel arrangement and handling in a miniaturized reactor core. Another teaching technique puts trainees with an instructor into a full-scale replica of a reactor control room where they face a simulated emergency. In this training situation, Students learn about both nuclear power plant and fuel-related operations on exact replicas of equipment they'll operate at real power plants. Fuel suppliers and others give support to utilities. Engineers and technicians offer a number of specialized services, providing help in fuel management, reactor licensing, and other technical information. For example, a computerized monitoring system calculates details of fuel performance in reactor cores and then displays the data graphically on a video terminal. And they carry out non-destructive testing procedures. A full-sized but simulated fuel bundle is subjected to a variety of conditions that could occur in a reactor. A newer technology could signal the next nuclear fission advance. This is a prototype breeder reactor. It actually produces more fuel than it uses, a capability that has obvious implications in the search for energy independence. It can extend the usefulness of available uranium resources more than 50-fold. In the United States, breeder reactors like this one in Idaho are only experimental now. But other countries have full-scale versions 
and the U.S. government, in partnership with the electric utility industry, is continuing to examine the role of the breeder reactor in this country. Though a research reactor, it has generated more than one million megawatt hours of electricity, which was fed into the local power network. And many scientists and other experts believe that breeder reactors are a needed option for our energy future. Breeders produce plutonium, the fuel that can be recovered and recycled for their continuing operation. But they produce slightly more than they consume. Since highly concentrated and very pure plutonium is also used for nuclear weapons, it is essential to control the use of this material. While international safeguards are in place now, worldwide efforts to strengthen the control system are underway too. About one-third of the fuel in today's commercial nuclear reactors must be replaced each year. But residual uranium can be used again. In fact, recycled fuel would add over 30% more life to our uranium supply. A recycle process takes place at Idaho Chemical Processing Plant owned by the federal government. The spent fuel, no longer efficient, is shipped by truck inside carefully designed casts. Only spent fuel from government reactors arrives here. Reprocessing plans by private industry were halted by U.S. policy in 1977 and spent fuel from commercial reactors is currently held at the utility sites. But government support of commercial reprocessing has recently been restored. For several months before treatment, this fuel is stored in water-filled storage pools to control the heat generated by its radioactivity. From storage, the casts of spent fuel are transported to the reprocessing building. Behind the wall on the right, shielded by five feet of concrete, the actual reprocessing takes place. Acid dissolves the spent fuel and the uranium is recovered. Samples are studied extensively during reprocessing. Using remote control manipulator arms, technicians perform a variety of fuel tests. Even with full-scale reprocessing in this country, a small quantity of highly radioactive waste would remain and would be solidified for permanent storage. So at sites like this basalt mine in the state of Washington, experiments are underway for permanent isolated waste storage. A federal responsibility, the program must plan to deal with residual waste material. Or if spent fuel is not reprocessed, a mass of waste 25 times as large. Testing is now going on to determine where and how nuclear waste in a solid, non-leachable state could be buried. Some natural geologic formations, such as salt or rock, seem ideal because of their proven stability over millions of years. Other nations are proceeding with disposal systems of their own and are cooperating with the U.S. in areas of technology of common interest. The United States has been the world leader in developing nuclear fuel and demonstrating that it is proven, safe, clean, and economical. Energy self-sufficiency, 
requires contributions from every practical and economic source. Commercial nuclear electricity has been produced in a socially responsible manner for about 25 years in both the United States and abroad. The facts about it are now becoming more widely known. From a different perspective, new light is shed. Thank <laughs> you.